Hello, my name is Dr. Kathleen Turner at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance, University of Limerick in Ireland. And my presentation today is Arts Practice Research, Exploring the Identity of the Community Musician Through Song and Story. I'd like to talk to you about why I chose arts practice research, what tools I have used, what I have learned through using this approach, and some examples from my practice. So why did I choose arts practice research? When I began my PhD, I had been working as the community engagement manager for the Irish Chamber Orchestra for a number of years. As part of my role, I was the project manager and singing and songwriting facilitator on a community music project called Sing Out With Strings, which provides singing, songwriting and instrumental workshops for primary school children in Limerick City. As the programme developed, I had so many questions for my practice. At the time I wrote in my work journal, I know something meaningful is at work here. I want to clarify what it is and why it is important. As Bartleet and Higgins tell us in the opening of the Oxford Handbook, it's not enough to say something miraculous is happening in community music. We have to delve deeper. We have to be rigorous. I wanted to examine and interrogate my practice as a community musician. But that was difficult. I was trying to capture the meaning of work that was inherently intangible, people-centered and messy. I'll give you an example. One day in school, just a normal Friday, I was working with a group of children aged seven and eight. And as we were singing, one particular girl just decided in the moment to tell me how it felt for her when she sang. She said, it feels like when I'm standing on the beach with my toes in the sand. Now I know in my flesh and bones exactly what that girl means. I know because I have felt that too. Singing for me feels like a pull in my chest. As I wrote in a song I composed for my father, it feels like words that are stitched between your soul and mine. But I can't put that in a funding application. I can't write that in a program evaluation. Or can I? As Ronald Pelias said, I know there is more than making a case, more than establishing criteria and authority, more than what is typically offered up. That more has to do with the heart, the body, the spirit. I was looking for ways to help me articulate the knowledge we held in our body, in our bones, in our voices, in the music we made. I wanted to understand the visceral as well as the verbal. I wanted to value what was happening in the heart, the body, the spirit. And I wanted to share that understanding. That meant I had to develop ways, not only to interrogate my practice as a community musician, but to invite other people into that experience. Through text, yes, but eventually also through story and through song because those are the tools I use as an artist. I needed to learn how to translate that understanding for an audience. As Elliot Eisner says, I wanted to engage in the magical feat of transforming the contents of our consciousness into a public form that others can understand. You see, when I began my research, I kept my personal and professional selves very separate. I put my community music self into one box and my personal creative self into another. In one place, I was the community musician, the researcher, the facilitator, the student, the project manager, the fundraiser, the advocate. In the other place, my own personal creative place, I was an artist, a 
a singer, a songwriter, a storyteller. I kept the lines between myself separate. I knew I was motivated to be a community musician. I knew I believed in the innate creativity of every citizen, that I was committed to equality of access to the arts, to inclusion, to agency, to social justice, to creative impact. But I hadn't stopped to consider where that came from, where the values that informed my work originated, what beliefs, privileges, or assumptions I carried into the community space with me, how those impacted how I saw the room, how I perceived the people I worked with, how I understood the value or the spirit of what we made together. And so I embarked on this process of interrogating my role as a community musician. And here are some of the tools that I used. I began to make timelines of specific, significant musical and social memories. And I often used photographs as sources for reflection. These helped me to examine my values, motivations, hopes and intentions. Essentially, I returned to that basic question of why I became a community musician in the first place. I'll give you an example. Here is a photograph that I used in my research. A moment just like any other that I'm sure holds no particular significance for anyone else. A woman leading a small group of children in a song. But it does become more significant when I notice that the woman leading the song, dressed in blue, is my mum. And the girl with the curly hair in the back row is me. I was about five years old in that picture. Here's another woman dressed in blue, leading a group of children in a song. Again, it's just another picture except that this time, the woman in blue is me. 30 years later, I'm standing on a stage that I first sang on when I was 13 years old. And I can remember now exactly where I stood, exactly how I felt. As we sang, we were the embodiment of power and joy. I had grown up feeling that possibility in singing and I just assumed that every child should have that. That every citizen should have access to that. That is why I am a community musician. That is why I was standing in front of those children, leading them in a song. I can trace my values, my motivations, my ethos as a community musician back and back and back to that woman leading a song in her blue jumper when I was five years old. I used my journals as the basis for autoethnographic writing, storying and restoring experiences in a way to investigate them. And this led to noticing, questioning, understanding, applying and developing my knowledge. I deepened my reflexive practice through this process. As the autoethnographer Andrew Sparks says so beautifully, this kind of writing can inform, awaken, and disturb. That was certainly my experience. I'll give you an example from my journal, a moment in a single workshop that I revisited through story a number of times. First, looking for the facts, then for the feelings, and then for what I could learn. In my first reflection on this workshop, I noticed Jay, a little boy who stood in the front row with his arms crossed, angry face, in absolute refusal to sing the song because he didn't like it. And fair enough, he showed me exactly how he felt. He was exercising his personal agency. The second time I reflected on the workshop, I remembered David. He was standing at the back of the room, so deeply moved 
by hearing the harmony in the song for the first time that he sang with his eyes closed and his face turned up towards the ceiling with tears silently falling as he smiled and sang. And the third time I wrote, I reflected on the same workshop, looking for what I could learn. This is what I wrote. Kathleen, recognize that your texts are composed. They are not fact, they are narrative weavings, recollections and reinterpretations of moments of socio-musical significance for you. It may be that these moments were also of great importance to others in the room. But it may also be the case that these moments passed by without the notice of anyone else. It could very well be that no one else shared your response or that the moments were noticed by others but they responded to them differently according to their perspective, shaped by their age, their gender, their relationship with music or with this particular piece of music, even their physical position in the room. Jay was annoyed. He didn't want to do the actions. You noticed this and discussed it with him, but you were more impacted by David's emotional response to the music. Consider this. There were 44 children in the room that day, and you only remember the expressions of two. This leads me to a primary tool of investigation in my arts practice research, autoethnographic songwriting. It led me away from a desire for proof of the value of community music and to a more nuanced understanding of our community of music making. It led me to a place of no right answers, but rather multiple ways of knowing, of being alert, awake, noticing. I could talk about this as an, ex as an example, but that would defeat the purpose of this kind of research, which is in part better sung than spoken. Before I close, I will say that arts practice research has helped me to approach my work as a community musician differently. I am more critically engaged now. I am more conscious of my language, my assumptions, my values, my experiences, what I carry into the workshop with me, and how these things frame my interpretations of the work. As Nib puts it, it's a kind of work that demanded not that I get it right, but that I get it differently. So allow me to close with a song. I'm going to leave you with a piece in which I explore the importance of empathy and kindness in my work, but also in my everyday. This is expressed not only through sound, but also through image in this video with visual artist Emer McNally and videographer Dominic Kozitsky. This is All Right By Me. stones left unturned keep you up at night all the bridges you have burned swallowed up your fight bitter words are biting see the stars going out one by one hold on at the end of the day all you need is someone to say you're all by the one 
ones you trust Heads are lost Words are spoken Pictures left in dust Bitter words Are biting you on the tongue You see the stars Someone to